Some time back, news channels in India were abuzz with fiery debates over India versus Bharat. There were polarizing views, where one side believed that since the name India was given to this country, or rather civilization, by outsiders who primarily arrived here as invaders, therefore we as a decolonized nation needed to replace it with a word from the native vocabulary, which is Bharat. The other side labelled such a demand as nothing more than a cosmetic change. And interestingly, even though the latter viewpoint sounds more like a conservative argument of continuing with the established norm, it came from the liberal section of Indian society. Such is the complexity of this nation. Therefore, one wonders, what does it mean to be Indian? And that is the title of our book, which we'll be discussing today, written by S.N. Balgangadhar and Sarika Rao. So, Adarsha, I think for the viewers who are not familiar with the authors, um, we must inform them that uh, S.N. Balagangadhar, popularly known as Balu, he runs, or I don't know if he currently does, but he has uh, run a research program in the Department of Comparative uh, Cultures at the University of Ghent in Belgium. And he has made some phenomenal contribution to the scholarship on India and how the West sees India. Uh, and he's cleared a lot of air. And he's spoken as someone who knows uh, Indian traditions intellectually uh, very soundly. And I think we are all indebted to him for that uh, intellectual exercise that he's carried carried out. <clears throat> so tell us more about the book. Uh, right. Uh, so as you have mentioned that uh, about Edson Balgangadhar and he's one of the foremost voices of decolonial studies uh, in context of India, if not the world. Uh, now, the point is that when we talk about decoloniality, the first notion that comes to our mind is of colonization. This is a word which we have heard in class 8th or 9th, uh, where we got to know that a certain company, like the East India Company, came in India and they uh, occupied the resources and colonized the people. Uh, interestingly, we in, in, in case of India, we are not taught that the colonizers were uh, had had been in this country even before because in case of Delhi Sultanate or in case of Mughals it became like they assimilated and they became our people but anyway uh, the truth is that we, India faced or suffered uh, two waves of colonization one by the uh, Islamic invaders and the other by the British colonizers each form of colonization was of a different kind so the output and the result of that was that our mindset changed mm. And it is quite visible when we start describing our own past, when we start uh, writing our own history. So S. N. Balgangadhar says that uh, the story of Indian intellectuals uh, elucidate this uh, suffering, uh, this uh, loss that India suffered. Mm -hmm. That we got two streams of intellectuals when it comes to history writing and when it comes to talking about our own culture. One is what we can label as uh, Nehruvian uh, intellectuals. So they saw the Indian past as that of orthodox uh, culture, uh, a sub, an oppressive system where caste was the fundamental oppressor and a certain section of society dominated on the other, the lower castes and so on and so forth. And then the waves of uh, outsider came in, not the colonizer, but outsiders, and then they somehow changed our culture. So they say that uh, some noted intellectuals from Nehruvian circle say that the Islamic invaders, they were not invaders, they are sort of liberators who liberated the lower caste from the mm -hmm. oppressive tyranny of the upper caste. Mm -hmm. and no, but before we go, go into the meat of the book, I right. think uh, it is worth mentioning that uh, this book, What Does It Mean to Be Indian, mm -hmm. uh, is one of Balu's most accessible works. Right. And I think that it is written for the lay audience uh, because a lot of people complain uh, that his work is very dense and very difficult to grasp. Right. Um, and it's mostly written for the academics only. Uh, and I think that his seminal work is The Heathen in His Blindness. And uh, a lot of people say that it is very difficult to read. 
so what he has done with this book is that he's taken his most important ideas and put them together in put them out in a language which you and I can understand right so I think from that perspective this book is very important or rather attempt to understand <laughs> yeah of course yeah right. maybe we'll not still be fully able to grasp it but yeah i mean it's um, i think he's done the readers a favor by uh, toning it down uh, without losing the complexity of the argument so so that is that is something that must be mentioned right at the start so yeah so then you were you were talking about the nehruvian intellectuals and right uh, so uh, the second ones are the reaction to the first hmm. so let me elaborate on the first uh, again the nehruvian intellectuals let's take an example of mahabharat when we tell the story of mahabharat we tell the story of our gods and uh, how they incarnated and gave the uh, message of gita and all for a nehruvian elite it will be like the story of warring tribes hmm. and they will say that may, there may be some case in india in let's say 5th 6th century when some tribes fought among themselves and later day uh, storytellers uh, introduced the myth of a god and the victorious were eulogized as uh, as those favored by the gods mm. right the second uh, stream of intellectuals uh, which uh, he uh, i can label them or i can use the term swadeshi intellectuals in that sense mm. that they were very proud of their own culture and they wanted it to be rationalized they wanted it to be not seen as some kind of superstition or myth right so they mention uh, i mean how they write it is that they uh, they believe that a lot of other exaggerations and poetic exaggerations and uh, myths and these these uh, devices were used to exaggerate certain accounts and that is how they they describe our gods right right and, and that's why the uh, the swadeshi intellectuals they see that we need to rationalize these myths and therefore they take the route of let's say finding archaeological evidence let's say in case of dwarka we see that uh, there has been attempt to say that there existed a, city, a mystical city of dwarka at let's say 10000 bc which get drowned by let's say a tsunami or whatever happened similarly they uh, try to find that literary evidence and then they say that okay these things happened but these things happened let's say uh, 20000 years back or 15000 years back most of them are like uh, like you can understand why they why there is a need to justify their beliefs because there's a prevalent notion is that if you cannot justify or if you cannot scientifically prove what you believe in then you, that is superstition mm. and believing in a superstition is something which is not good or mm. not seen as something uh, done by an educated person therefore this reaction comes in so balu says that both the streams of intellectuals are more or less a product of the colonized uh, historiography or rather the christian way of writing history hmm hmm standing in fact we had done a video on this at upward uh, the history versus itihasa and uh, that basically covers the same theme uh, and it relies on the works of another uh, set of scholars uh, joydeep bagji and vishwar duri uh, in which we explain that the notion of itihas is very different from the notion of history it's based on a lecture that that joydeep bagchi and vishwar luri had given at the icchr the indian council of historical research this is some 5 years back i think it was a brilliant lecture <clears throat> and uh, they in that uh, lecture he explained the genesis or the, or the fundamental motivation behind starting the discipline of history at uh, various western universities why it suddenly gained prominence mm. uh, and how our notion of history or itihas is different from that of history basically itihas is more of a uh, a tool to to impart culture as opposed to history which is a fact finding mission great right. but uh, one would say that yeah, even from learning history we learn about that culture or the culture which was prevalent in some years back or some ages back no, but it is more of a speculation rather than uh actually knowing the culture right. because i think that uh, where the primary difference lies is in the belief that the past can be known as a fact okay. which i think the indian tradition does not uh, really assert uh the past is more a bunch of stories 
uh, and those stories are extremely important but uh, there has been no uh, assertion that unless you know exactly when krishna was born right uh, you will not be able to attain moksha or, or do the things that he Correct. asked us to do uh, whereas in the christian tradition the the birth of christ jesus christ is a very very important event mm-hmm. historical event because that uh, proves their a uh, whole theological uh, dogma that you know there is this god and he will intervene in the affairs of humans at a single point in history and that human being will be a unique person as opposed to you know continuing a tradition again right so uh, so that difference i think is what makes all the difference between the two approaches that's why there's an emphasis on uh, establishing that certain deities existed or not or certain individuals existed or not in this timelines of history right like uh, in case of india we often say that whether lord ram existed at xyz time or not correct right? correct but then one can say that uh, why are even we fighting for the birthplace because we cannot prove it no but the birth no no it's not a question of proving or not no one right. says that uh, bhagwan ram did not exist right but he exists in within us in our minds right. as stories so those stories are what hmm. uh, really drive us those stories are what connect us to the divinity of uh, of that historical person right uh, while in the case of uh, the western historiography of histori- historiography it is very different that they they uh, everything is external that everything has to happen in in that sense and you have to scientifically establish that chronology and timeline mm-hmm. and uh, unless that you can do then it is all fiction So uh, what you're saying is that there's no onus upon us to prove that Lord Ram uh, was born in Ayodhya. Yeah, I mean, as far as the tradition is concerned, it is uh, we are indifferent to that question because we do believe that he existed. Right. Now, why do we have to go uh, all the way to establish through material evidence that there was this king Ram who mm-hmm. existed at this point in history? Right. It doesn't matter. I mean, for us, whether he existed. Three thousand years back, or thirteen thousand years back, or hundred thousand years back makes no difference. No, to right. to what Lord Ram means hmm. to us. Right. So, and that more or less that's immaterial. The yeah number of years I am. Yeah. So, uh, the book ends with a very in- oh, sorry, not the book. The cha- first chapter ends with a very interesting remark, and that is uh, m- making itihas into history would destroy our past because as the world shows us today. the best way to destroy the past of a people is to give them history yeah i think that is one of the most uh, brilliant quotes in this book that you give people history and you destroy their past which is what i was alluding to just now that um the past exists within us mm. and we derive teachings from it and we make past relevant to the present and how that happens is very uh, unique very individual in that sense that each of us is trained to think of the past in a certain way and to connect to divinity and to connect to the avatars in a certain manner and uh, that the tradition informs us but once you historicize that and once you make it part of some uh, archaeological finding and you know all those mm-hmm. things then it became then it becomes a political tool right. and uh, that uh, politicization of our itihas leads to history right. i think that's what okay. it is okay uh, let me ask this question uh, why is christian hist- history uh, can't be called itihas because they also have stories they also have some mythical element to their stories or stories of divinity yeah but that is uh, uh, the protestant reformation is what uh, emphasizes on the historicism okay. before that when there was catholicism uh, they also relied heavily on a lot of mm-hmm. of these uh, what they call myths and uh, stories in fact the old testament is full of them and none of them can be uh, really uh, you know Proved described up. as described right. as historical characters that way it's all speculation uh, so yeah that is there but uh, after the protestant reformation uh, the emphasis was on history and the fact that it was it happened in the same time as the other revolutions like the scientific revolution right and the industrial revolution everything was you know in a continuum that way 
and so the world was changing and the way in which uh, people connected especially the westerners who were the colonizers at that time how they were connecting with uh, their past was changing and their the nature of the religion itself was changing so the problem is with the pro- protestant reformation as opposed to because in the catholic religion uh, you will notice that there is a lot of emphasis on religion because uh, on on ritual which had made a backdoor entry again back into christianity so uh, if we tell uh, tell the tale of christianity is that when they were against the when they are fighting the pagans uh, they derided the ritual aspect of it because pagans were too much into the uh, ritualistic form of worship uh, to their deities and the gods multiple gods and all that and later on they sort of uh, appropriated the same practices yeah, what what rajiv malhotra would call digestion right because rituals are so powerful that you cannot do without them so you kind of use them you take them uh, in your structure digest them and use it misuse it <laughs> or whatever you abuse it <laughs> in a certain way but uh, since you said rituals are that powerful that you cannot uh, do away with them then why did the people who were practicing rituals l- lose out in the first place uh, are you talking about the romans or uh, pagans yeah no but i mean those are very histori- historically complex questions right. i think it is it could be stupid to dumb it down to saying that oh they lost because, because of rituals because of whatever you know right. the, a lot of forces that were at play and i don't i don't pretend to know the exact answer right. but those who do uh, also don't know very <laughs> <laughs> right. uh-huh. so moving on to the next chapter uh, the title is symbolically interpreting shiva right so since uh, we mentioned about stories and how stories can be interpreted in different ways uh, to the extent that i believe in, in past decade we have heard that how uh, lord ganesh underwent a sort of a plastic surgery or something just to some people said that to prove that it happened uh, similarly uh, Bal, uh, so balu narrates a story where he was attending a conference uh, in india only and some foreign delegate asked that what is this statue of lord ganesh uh, so what are those these two statues symbolize so and the ladies and the people who was an indian lady said that uh, they are lord ganesh and goddess durga so when the foreign delegate asked so what are they uh, so she said these are aesthetic objects wow. <laughs> uh, now of course he was infuriated with such a comment and he went on to elaborate like no these are gods and what are the meanings and all of that now the point is that when someone comes up with a story that he gives a new interpretation to it like the plastic surgery is just an interpretation mm-hmm. and it happened let's say the, the head was cut off so a new head was brought mm-hmm. brought in and transplant and yeah. whatever you can call it uh, similarly someone told him that the worship of uh, lord shiva is uh, is like worshiping of a fertility cult because uh, lingam denotes a sexual organ mm-hmm. and it was the later day ancestors of hindus who sort of out of shame you do say that they came up with these puranic stories uh, which sort of gave uh, mean different meaning and different interpretation to it and so w- how do you see that no i see the struggle in the it's the same kind of struggle that you were referring to earlier between the nehruvian intellectuals and the and what balu calls the hyper nationalists right where one side is completely denying that there is any merit to uh, india's past <laughs> and the other side is saying no 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 we are so great and that everything that is written in the puranas is history and you know you can't right. call it mythology as if mythology is a bad word so mm-hmm. mythology being a bad word uh, is a colonial project mm-hmm. but the the funny part is that the people who claim that or or who feel proud about their culture have already inter- internalized that disdain for mythology mm-hmm. whereas mythology is such a beautiful uh you know it's a universe in itself and some would even call it hyper reality as opposed mm-hmm. to uh false history right. or whatever right you're talking about what is hyper reality hyper reality as in your thing you're talking about things and events or entities or phenomena that uh are beyond the mind right, right. so they're supramental and in that uh, zone obviously your uh mental constructs and your rationality falls short describing them or trying to understand them so you reduce that mm-hmm. or you reduce the essence of that uh by making stories out of those forces right. those whatever you know those entities 
so essentially it's about divinity it's about the deities the ved you know mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands of beings mm-hmm. that we can't see you know so the fundamental assumption is that there is so much in this world that we we are not even aware of right um and so that th- that is the same uh, difference uh, that that reflects here also when when you talk about the uh, worship of shivalinga uh, there is on the one side i don't know why they make such a big deal of it by the way i mean uh, there uh, recently i saw this uh, not recently some years back i saw a kashmiri muslim woman she had made a video ये कैसे लोग हैं जो ये लिंग की पूजा करते हैं ये ये इनको शर्म नहीं आती मतलब सो एट द बॉटम ऑफ दैट इज अम दैट यू नो यू आर वर्शिपिंग सेक्शुअल ऑर्गन बट आई डोंट सी द फर्स्ट इन इट इवन इफ यू आर वॉट्स बिग डी ऑन द अदर साइड देर इज आई मीन दीज गेज दे आर एट अ कम्प्लीट डिनाइल नो 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 दिस इज नॉट द सेक्शुअल ऑर्गन वाइल द टेक्सट दम सेल्स हैव वेरियस स्टोरीज uh you know from agni puran ling puran shiv puran they have different accounts of how the shivling worship started itself right. or why do we worship the ling and some of them allude to us the male sexual organ and some mm. of them don't mm. and both are equally valid right and it depends on which uh, path you are following which tradition you belong to and that's that it's as simple as that i don't see the fuss uh, in the first place and what balu refers to here is exactly that that it's uh, it's a story and it's based on it's passed on to you by tradition and you worship because it is tradition right and it's as simple as that but um, well, the argument will come and which uh, arya samaj was uh, alluded into every now and then back back then when they were very active now they are not thankfully <laughs> so <laughs> they used to say that since the stories are contradictory in nature Yeah, that one Puran says something and the other says something else. Then how can both be true at the same time? Either it's day or it's night. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That is the historicize historicization of uh, of tradition. Right. Uh, that's the Protestant Christianity creeping into Hindu uh, mindsets and the Hindu mindset, right. where you say that oh, you cannot have contradictory stories. Well, you can because contradiction is a very human thing. I mean, it's it's a perception of the human mind that you have this or that. But when you're talking about things which are beyond the human mind, then contradictions are par for the course. Right. And different, uh, you know, a deity, for example, manifests in a single deity manifests in contradictory ways at different places. So, right. how do you explain that? Right. But but then one will say that. Uh... the search of truth becomes futile because uh, as even balu says that to the ancient greeks the predicates of true and false were simply not applicable to many of the stories about their deities the point will come that if true and false is not applicable then there is no search for truth in itself yeah that's what balu uh, claims in the book also he writes that uh, the indian tradition is primarily a tradition of knowledge seeking as opposed to truth seeking right now that may seem problematic in one sense because ultimately we talk about satyam shivam sundaram you know mm-hmm. that, that the highest truth is right something to be pursued and that is equated with moksha and liberation that brahm is called satya and uh, exactly. so on so forth right um uh, but what he is referring to uh as i see it is that there are many temporal truths that are provisional in nature and that there is no finality to truth and so the indian tradition is more about pursuit of knowledge about how to you know get things done whether it is in the temporal in the material or the spiritual plane uh, how do you get things done how do you reach a certain goal and that is what knowledge is so it is knowledge centric as opposed to truth centric is what he says uh, is knowledge same as information in this case no knowledge is more like a know how knowledge is vidya uh, you know like uh again there are so many words for it in our languages that uh, gyan is also knowledge and vidya is also knowledge but the two differ in themselves gyan i think is more processed is more uh, revelatory knowledge while vidya is more specific in terms of uh, getting things done no how right yeah so uh, you have tantra vidya for mm-hmm. example so the, the very ki- various kinds of prayogs that you can do to achieve a certain end uh, and that is more uh vidya 
but uh, i mean leaving aside all that what balu is talking about is the primacy of knowledge over uh, what you would call as provisional truths right. uh, because they are provisional in nature and as your consciousness rises or right. falls correct right. the truths change right so uh, one thing that he says is that uh, all truth is not knowledge like uh, a telephone directory has two statements but they are not knowledge obviously yeah. Yeah. Uh, Simil, but all knowledge is truth. Now, the point will come is that how do we know that the knowledge is right or wrong? The point of misinformation, the point of ignorance. Well, uh, the knowledge is right or wrong is uh, self-evident to a practitioner uh, okay. because if if you are pursuing knowledge, uh, you are basically practicing as opposed to just speculating. Right. And when you are practicing, uh, it becomes self-evident because. whether you are making progress whether you are because hmm. as i said knowledge is uh, you know oriented towards a certain end and it, it is up to you to decide whether you are going right. close to that uh, desired goal or not and that judgment is yours so there it is quite easy to judge whether a knowledge is actually correct or not or whether it is uh, whether it delivers what it is supposed to do or not right so basically uh, unless a person doesn't undergo a complete process through a tradition uh, uh, the hindu tradition he's not able to figure out that whether the knowledge that he has been imparted is right yeah, or so wrong yeah so that empirical nature of knowledge is mm-hmm. what we are talking about here that right. empir- empiricism here would mean verifiable mm-hmm. and that is what he is saying that you know by making it like that and it's not scientific knowledge again right. it's not third person empiricism mm-hmm. it could also be first person empiricism where you are yourself your subjectivity is the judge mm-hmm. uh, of whether you are progressing or not and uh, you can't prove or disprove it in a laboratory right so lest it be taken in the other sense that you know hinduism is scientific which right. is another trope which uh, is very popular uh, it it must be made clear that there is a huge difference between first person empiricism and third person empiricism so is there not a collective uh, aspect of knowledge yes of course there is because if it has been verifiable only by an individual individual's internal process of experiencing it then uh, how can it be there on a mass scale like no but that also depends on the kind of knowledge like even the basic difference uh, the knowledge of the knowledge of deities let's no no i'm saying the basic difference between uh, vidyas is the para and the apara right right so depending on which domain the knowledge is about there is Uh, the possibility or the feasibility of having a common vocabulary a common currency right. uh, and more people you know agreeing on a certain aspect of it right. uh, but again then that goes to the question of pramanas and right. where the shastra comes in let's not digress there mm-hmm. but uh, like, i mean to answer your question specifically yes i mean it is verifiable and a lot of people can come to a consensus on uh, what kind of knowledge is so there is mundane knowledge also like there is knowledge of astronomy in the indian text right. there is knowledge of mathematics as well there is mm. knowledge of metallurgy so on and so forth right. there is also knowledge of astrology now astrology mm. is not as demonstrable or as easy to prove mm-hmm. in a scientific sense right. as astronomy which is why the it is brushed aside as uh, superstition right right uh, moving on to the next chapter which is about what is culture uh In the previous chapter, Balu emphasized on stories being the mode of transmission of knowledge, uh, and essentially forms the bedrock of a culture. Like which kind of stories is being uh, told to you, uh, essentially forms your worldview, and hmm. through that it forms the culture you are come living in, you are being brought up in, all of that. And he says that that any group that survives as a culture would thus have built two extremely rich storehouses containing two things: linguistic items and actionable items. former is essentially language while latter are the institutions and both together determine our social interactions latter institution like the form of family marriage and other institutions right. and language is the kind of vocabulary we use to uh, describe all of the, the interactions because it's really universal correct and he says that the what shapes the interaction between two eventually leads to the configuration of different cultures the actionable and the linguistics when they interact and they form a new culture yeah uh, in case of west the guiding force is religion whereas in india it is ritual right and then he goes on to make the claim that when islam and christianity entered india 
they met a culture that was already formed as a stable configuration of learning. As a result, these religions had to adapt themselves to, to this culture to survive. Thus, Indian Christianity and Islam remain Indian irrespective of their religious beliefs and practices. Now, that's a very contentious comment to make. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I mean, uh, it's a slippery slope argument. Right. Uh, while at, at a certain Let, level... Let's begin with the first part uh, of religion and ritual leading to different cultures. Yeah, so again, this is, uh, <clears throat> this is part of Balu's conceptual universe. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the scholars and academics from this Ghent school uh, do tend to uh, assert that Hinduism is not a religion which leads to uh, you know a backlash of sorts because it has political implications in today's right. world um, but to understand their point of view I think uh, we can you know we can be more <clears throat> charitable and accommodative and let let ourselves go with the flow of what they're talking about because I think a lot of the things that he wants to convey uh, happen through theorizing and therefore uh, his theory that Hinduism is not a religion at the bottom of that is a definition of religion that he has crystallized that this is what religion is now there may be a lot of uh, debate over what religion actually is but to him this is what religion is let's say he has sort of defined religion in the Christian mold and he's saying that Hinduism is that way not even a religion so the political uh, implications of that aside, mm -hmm. I think we can go with that flow and say that, okay, this is what you mean. And uh, what he's saying here in this specific case is that mm, uh, there is a what constitutes uh, the actionable items of culture in the Indian tradition is ritual, while in the other is religion. By religion here, he means the Christian religion and specifically, you know, the commandments kind of religion where you have these 10 commandments and some dogmas that you believe and you know just go through life with that set of beliefs so as per him that uh, the structure of christianity of commandments uh, text uh, uh, god single god yeah. single god in text and uh, and the stream of the the superstructure of christianity only that is religion like any any tradition that can align itself to exactly that form will be called a religion Otherwise, it, uh, it doesn't that's, hold to be a religion. That's what I get from his argument. So, that's what he's saying that that is what religion is. Uh, some people may object and say that we need to own the term religion and say that no, no, what we are is a religion and what they are is not. But I think that, you know, that can go on endlessly. But just to understand, that's why I said just to understand his point of view, I think right. we can, you know, just go with the flow and say that, okay, this is religion. Okay. And the emphasis on ritual is basically the emphasis on praxis on being performative that you do things as opposed to just abide by a certain set of rules right um that interestingly also has a uh, has an implication on another argument that he makes i think in chapter uh, i don't remember which chapter but he talks about law uh, so we'll come to that later right? the law of secular secularism no that how law is Im okay right. implemented on a culture you know is is law the is law the bedrock of culture or does law actually uh, come from, you know, uh, formalizing certain right. uh, convenient arrangements of culture? Right. So, how does he uh, describe uh, Hinduism? Uh, no, he calls Hinduism as a false uh, notion. Entity, right. Uh, he says that there is no such thing as Hinduism. Uh, India is a land of great traditions and that uh, there is a lot of there are a lot of contradictions between these traditions and uh, some of the traditions appear to be very, very different, which we all know. I mean, that's the right. fabled land of diversity that India is. And to club it all together and give it some sort of a religious um, mm. makeover is a crime in his eyes. Right. So, the difference between a tradition and a religion, if I remember from the book, of Jacob de Ruver, uh, Europe Indian Limits of Secularism, he delves upon this subject uh, since he also comes from the same school. Uh, he said that uh, religion comes from more like a, a central figure of a church, let's say, where they are supreme. Whereas in case of tradition, you more or less follow what your ancestors followed. Right, right. You have been, you do not go behind like what is the origin of the story. 
like where like for example most people do not know most of the stories where is it uh, cited hmm, hmm. the uh, stories of god let's say if i talk about a very fam- famous story of bhasmasur uh, and lord shiva hmm. most people won't know that in how many purans does this story come yeah yeah correct or uh, where uh, did we find it the first time correct Right. Uh, but we believe in the story because we have been told by our ancestors similarly that rituals that we do we have been doing it because we have been told by our ancestors we do not go behind in searching for it right but what's wrong in that endeavor if you go behind in searching for it that's what the uh, reformist of uh, india have attempted to do there after is, 18th century yeah there is nothing wrong in it look, most people have been i mean most scholars do it most academics do it right the west has been at it for ages now and their uh, their uh, counterparts in india are also doing the same as you said there's nothing wrong in it but that is not the tradition is what balu was saying <laughs> so you might no, do it but don't I'm saying that don't call it the indian tradition don't call it the hindu way, way of, of doing way of doing yeah no um, what they're saying is that uh, every culture goes from a uh, different transformation so this is a transformation of hindu culture let's say where people started finding let's find the truth or not the truth but the evidence of the mm. things that we practice from our text mm. so that we can we can be better informed let's say yeah so that already signifies a break from the tradition it right. already signifies a disruption mm. because if your uh, if your mindset has changed w- what ultimately is tradition or culture about it is to preserve a certain mindset and right. while that may evolve over a long period of time and it may go through in- incremental changes mm-hmm. based on how the environment is changing it cannot suddenly mm-hmm. uh, you know negate everything that has gone before it right. and declare itself to be the sole arbiter of the matter of right. <laughs> divinity so that is a lot of these uh, movements like brahmo samaj arya samaj mm-hmm. and you know these christian inspired uh, sects that is what they do uh, and that is why they are not part of the tradition so there is no place for rationality no rationality is very much a part of the indian tradition but right. it has its limits right. uh, it, it is used in very specific contexts it's used right. where it deserves to be used how will you apply rationality to to gods okay. you know is because by definition whether you believe it or not just conceptually speaking hmm. the gods are beyond the human mind and therefore to apply the standards of human mind to the gods is a foolish exercise absolutely absolutely uh, so let's come to the second part of the argument right about islam and christianity right so yeah so again um, you know there is some merit to the argument i believe in saying that yeah there is a indian version of islam and there is an indian version of christianity as you can see uh, you know i'll give you two examples one is the prevalence of uh, so called jati consciousness within mm. within the indian muslims and indian christians uh, that who they were before they converted they remember that they have a ancestral memory of that technically even in pakistan even in pakistan yeah because that is part of right. the indian subcontinent and this so it is there uh, and that makes them different from maybe other parts muslims in other parts um and the other is the emergence of tablighi jamaat mm-hmm. so tablighi jamaat came to be because they recognized that these are not uh, hardcore uh, islamic enough right that the, the, the people of the subcontinent may any day revert mm-hmm. to the old ways of the pagans correct and correct. so this was a movement which came up to prevent that to block that uh, mm-hmm. you know that valve so to speak right. where the water could not flow back and that there is only the march forward then so yes there is uh, that argument and we we can safely give that some uh, space and consent right. but uh, it's a dangerous like we said it's a slippery slope because mm. now the realities are different now it's a globalized world right. and to continue believing in that would mean that we are putting ourselves at risk uh, because that is like almost like believing in fairy tales like how gandhi was mm-hmm. insisting on right. you know that there is this and even nehru mm-hmm. the the whole dream of nehruvian uh, secularism unity and diversity unity and diversity and also this idea of nationalism uh-huh. that came the nehruvian nationalism the territorial nationalism of india that we all grew we are uh, still practicing that yeah i mean to an extent we sent yeah the the, the so called normies are <laughs> <laughs> maybe the outliers are not but yeah uh, 
uh, whatever we were taught in school and uh, right. in in our formal education is that the, there is the national identity which should subsume all the religious or hmm. the sectarian differences and that is something to aspire for right uh, so that also comes from this idea that there is some unique indian islam and some unique indian christianity right. uh, which led to very dangerous outcomes so correct i mean uh, it would have been better had he used the example of sikhism because there the line is very uh, blur between hinduism and sikhism so to say ha no but that but then sikhism is part of the indian uh, religion right. the set of indian religion no, i mean i'm talking about the attempt to make it as a religion by the reformer sikh reformers of uh, 19th and 20th century no but here when they tried to no, but change here, the structure no, no but it's not the same thing no because here yeah. he is talking about uh, those who came from okay right so sikhism was not colonial right 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 ha since he's mentioning that religion two foreign religions came into yeah, india yeah, yeah. and it was the strength of the indian mm-hmm. culture which sort of uh, assimilated. assimilated and yeah. bri- bridged the gap between the yeah, two cultures yeah, yeah. right now, even today like uh, mm-hmm. many though it is getting increasingly rare because but in the previous generation a lot of the indian muslim musicians who actually came from right. uh, jatis who were practicing musicians for generations they continued to worship saraswati and you know have okay. that uh, that veneration to indian gods as well no i, I was recently told that uh, this <laughs> this much abused term ganga jamuni tehzeeb <laughs> was actually uh, quite visible in case of lucknow uh-huh. in the 18th century because of the interaction between the hindus and muslims at that so, time uh, um, it the possibility was that since muslims lost power over the course of time and sort of they reverted back to their original uh, practices correct correct that was the danger that was the danger for muslims and i think uh, one of the reasons for the maybe i mean i'm just speculating here mm-hmm. one of the reasons for the uh, establishment of the aligarh muslim university right. it it was almost like a precursor to the tablighi is a more intellectual response to the to to, to the threat right. that indian right. muslims may just completely give up on islam and you know right. just get absorbed in the larger uh that's why the 1880s of uh, the emphasis on two nation theory was yeah, very correct, much and correct. that too from muslim side not correct, from the hindu side correct, correct. which uh, technically the nehruvian hist- historians yeah, of so today so they are very interesting themes which i don't know why indian academy i i think i do now i mean huh? after reading balu you, it it becomes clear why the indian intellectuals don't delve into it in, yeah academics don't write papers on these very uh-huh. interesting themes right it is left to us engineers to discuss <laughs> so uh the next chapter comes from uh, the next chapter is uh, experience and anubhav the next two chapters hmm. are on this uh, and it was i was fairly confused when i was reading the mm-hmm. these so he says that uh, people often confuse an explanation of an experience with experience itself right consequently when you reject an explanation of an experience they mistakenly think you deny the experience itself right right, right. if the sun does not revolve around earth the geocentric explanation says it does that does not imply that our experience of the sun's apparent movement is false or wrong uh, yeah we do see sun moving from east to west in the morning although we know the scientific basis behind it like since we are also rotating mm-hmm. and this, this is a movement uh, so again it's point like uh, we have experienced that experience was true in itself if one can say that we do experience days and nights mm. uh, we are not saying that uh, the sun never sets mm-hmm. because we are looking at there's uh, visual evidence to it mm-hmm. although we have an explanation why it why this phenomena is seen to us something similar we can say in terms of gods that we don't know the actual uh, truth behind it but we do experience some power or some entities of it yeah i think it's a very uh, profound point that he makes actually this is one of my favorite parts of his of this book where he talks about the difference between an explanation of experience versus an experience itself mm-hmm. and uh, there are several examples of that for example you know male and female the sexual attraction between them that most teenagers most uh, potent people <laughs> experience <laughs> but uh, the scientific explanation of that is you know to do with hormones and you know right. that something gets triggered and then mm-hmm. there is and the, the evolutionary scheme behind it where this is important because it leads to reproduction right. and you know the, the species uh, continues 
So both are fine. I mean, mm-hmm. one is an explanation, but that in no way uh, takes away from the experience, experience itself. Because right. I mean, that is what you live. Right. So this is something that you live and something that you uh, think about. Right. So Two about every emotion. Like you can. Yeah. Uh, map out the chemical imbalances correct, that happen in the body. Correct, correct. Whether we experience joy, sorrow, or whatever. Yeah. Like and we thought of discussing that book, uh, stumbling on happiness. Exactly. Exactly. And again, that's uh, psychologists can give examples. Like this is happening because you experience this, this, this. Absolutely. But yeah, and uh, I mean, the point that you raised about uh, this, uh, the gods. I think uh, a good uh, this uh, how how you would see it in this lens is that the explanation of experience, for example of schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. So schizophrenia is such a difficult ailment to deal with mm-hmm. because of the nature of that. Because it deals with actual raw experience. Mm-hmm. That you see something, you hallucinate. What is hallucination? And how do you make that, uh, how, how do you classify that as false? And while the other stuff also, you get the same input from the same sensory organs. Right. Uh, and how do you process that? And why is, I mean, uh, someone would say that, you know, having a sakshatkar of a deity hmm. is also hallucination. hallucination. And so, so it's so confusing, it's so muddled. Um, but again, experience of the deity is first person and you experience it, you know what it is, right? right. Uh, you may not be able to communicate it well, you may not be able to tell other people exactly how it happened. But it does happen and hmm. it happened to you. Uh, and some... I mean, religious literature talks about difference between a hallucination and a sakshatkar as in how transformative that experience is. How right. how does that change you forever? Hmm. If it doesn't, then it's probably just right. a vision. But if it does, then it was something that, you know, uh, okay. something profound. So again, I mean, uh, now Balu goes back to explaining this in his own uh, very... Uh, persuasive way with saying with the good old question of caste again. <laughs> so he's talk about, he talks about uh, oppression in Indian society. He says that if you deny that caste is the basis of oppression in or that uh, or in Indian society, if you deny that statement, mm-hmm. you are only denying the explanation. You're not saying that there is no oppression. Right. But you're only saying that there is no oppression on account of these things that you have attributed to. So that I think is makes his um, right. this fairly clear w- what he's trying to say here. Right, the suffering and inequality is what people that experience, there, but the yeah. explanation given for it is uh, invalid in that yes, case. Yes, you see, right. Uh, and he, next, he says that Indian culture it is a culture where knowledge is mainly experiential in nature. It is practical knowledge that it means. To form and react upon experience. Right. This knowledge makes sense when rooted in experience. It is about experience. Its goal is to shape and transform human experience. Correct. Correct. Right? Correct. So, as, as we have earlier discussed, that this is more of what an individual goes through. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, st- strangely or paradoxically, it is very indi- individualistic that way uh, right. because it empowers the individual. Right. But the empowerment of the individual in the dharmic mm-hmm. scheme is through uh, his. Uh, um, integration within society. Mm. Right? So y- there is no individual who is uh, free from all right. uh, connections and you know the web of life so to speak. So that integration within the larger society <coughs> is what makes the individual fulfilled and complete. <coughs> and the next chapter talks about it. It is introspecting experience where he says that uh, the West emphasizes on the uniqueness of an individual uh, when they do a psychoanalysis of the person, whereas in our case, it is more about, more about integrating the peculiarities of a uh, behavior. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so in this one, <clears throat> I think I uh, I am not sufficiently huh. informed. But the question that comes to my mind when I read uh, uh, Balu on this matter mm-hmm. is, when we say West, I mean, is the classic question of is uh, modernity the same as Westernization? Mm-hmm. Because modernity has struck everyone globally. Even the West is modernized. Right. But was the pre-modern West more like us in that sense? Even with Christianity and everything. So that again is a question. I think a lot of the Western scholars would have worked on it. Uh, But I am not very familiar with that idea. Right. Because uh, 
the point that he uh, concludes in the book is that in the West, one deals with the internal mental life as an expression of unique self uh, that each human being has. In India, there is neither an inner self unique to each one of us, nor is there any privileged knower that yeah. cognizes yeah, the meaning of these I mean, the, expressions. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would call this more like a modern versus Indian traditional. Right. Because I don't know what uh, pre-modern West uh-huh. uh, exactly had to say on this. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the, the the conflict here is, or the difference here is between the modern individualistic uh, framework framework versus the traditional uh, more integrative framework. Right. So uh, so yes. So the emphasis on individual creates a lot of these problems right. where uh, you are seen as complete in yourself, mm. which is a very stupid and ignorant way i mean to right. objectively speaking uh, because the individual means nothing really i mean it, you are dependent on your environment you are dependent on your the flora and fauna around you the bacteria not to mention the people around you so, right correct uh, so again he comes back to this part of uh, colonial experience and colonial consciousness and since we have earlier mentioned that how uh, culture flows from transmission of knowledge and stories is the uh, best way to uh, Trans- transmitted further to next generation. Hmm. Uh, he says that it is my hypothesis that Islamic colonialism arrested the transmission of many of the theories that has crystallized in Indian culture. Hmm. Our theories about society, people and nature. By arresting their transmission, by breaking the unity that was established between these theories and our daily experience, Islamic colonialism inflicted violence on Indian people. Hmm. Uh, so basically he said that since there was uh, the clash was such a violent clash that it decimated a lot of institutions that we have built over the course of uh, over the course of millennia mm. uh, that it came to a sudden halt mm. that we have sort of lost the, our own conception of uh, people society and nature mm. but didn't that happen much later during the british era because while we were resisting the uh, islamic invaders we did had institutions which uh, could resurrect at times Whenever there was a Hindu kingdom established, let's say take an example of Vijayanagar hmm. when it happened. So the revivalism was constantly at play whenever we fought with the Islamic uh, invaders. One can say that we become more inward because preserving was uh, was a more cherished goal than actually expanding on it and taking risks to uh, enhance it any further. So we went, become more conservative in that approach, right. we can say. Uh, but the main impact sort of happened quite late. No, the, I wouldn't say, it, I wouldn't call it a main impact. I would say that it happened in two stages. Hmm. One was, the first stage was the Islamic stage, right. where it happened externally. Hmm. The external institutions got uh, were under duress and uh, people did not have access to what he calls the resources of socialization. Right. So when life got disrupted that way and you no longer had that access to experience uh, in the raw form, in the way in which it was supposed to happen within uh, Indian culture. Uh, So that created uh, an inward looking or more preserving sort of attitude over the centuries, right? where uh, new experiences were not no longer assimilated, new experiences were not taken into account when you were even as the culture was evolving and the outside world was changing. But in the second stage, which is the British colonialism, uh, the virus really got internalized and it started, uh, you know, having its effect on the Indian mind. So that I think is the distinction. And I think the first stage was uh, absolutely necessary for the second stage to happen. Because I think that uh, unless that external weakening had not happened uh, had mm-hmm. happened uh, it would have been more difficult to you know percolate these ideas uh, right. either into, into the indian mind right so uh, yeah there could have been a good possibility that we would have uh, sort of evaded the creep- yeah, creeping I mean, in of i mean what if there are many what if what if like yeah, like uh, to draw a parallel more like the how japanese uh, sort of resisted correct till correct. very late correct, uh, correct. i guess uh, even till the Second World War happened. Correct, correct. So, so it's almost like saying that, you know, you, the, the first meant that you were, uh, the environment played a role hmm. in weakening you. And then the second stage happened where the actual disease 
stuck in Iraq, right? Yeah, uh, so he meant that colonialism just uh, restricted our access of knowledge and it uh, break, uh, sort of shattered the transmission lines, if we can say that. Uh, in case of the second wave of uh, uh, colon colonialism, which was done by the Christian rulers, the Britishers, he said that religion expands. Religion here means more or less, I guess, Christianity. Mm. Uh, it expands in two ways, conversion and secularization. Christianity secularizes itself in the form of a de-Christianized de Christianity. The Enlightenment period identif identified as the age of reason is alleged to be the apotheosis of the process of secularization of Western culture. So he's saying that the entirety of the Western culture is nothing but a secularized form of Christianity where you have just taken the God away or the, or the obvious symbols of religion mm. away mm. and you have given the conception to the people and said this is the most logical and valid uh, conception of world correct, correct. and that is since uh, i believe that he he would he'll agree that since the europeans conquered the world more or less majority part of the world uh, this notion became prevalent in every structure across the globe mm. uh, the idea of uh, god man and the mediation between the two, which was basically a Protestant idea when they were revolting against the uh, Catholics. And they said the Catholics, we don't need any mediator. We don't need any mediator because it's a private affair. The argument that most of the people in India come, especially the Nehruvian school comes, no, that religion should be private. Yesterday also Ramchandra Guha wrote an article right. uh, where he said that it is my private matter. Um, my mother-in-law used to practice uh, worship Lord Ram. <laughs> it's different time he eats beef and then <laughs> says. But anyway, that's a different point. But that's the argument, like the Ramchandra Guha school of uh, history writing in India. Mm. Everybody just parrots this line that it has to be a private affair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Without saying that, where does this idea even originate from? Correct. It originates from Protestant Christianity. Yeah. That it has to be a private affair. Yeah, yeah. If it is a public affair, then, uh, then more or less you are just uh, disconnecting yourself from God and giving yourself in the hands of clergy. Yeah, because the public display of religion and mm. public expression of religion right. is highly ritualistic. Uh -huh. How else would it be? Uh, and it has to have external symbols and uh, you have to carry those symbols and you have to <coughs> honor those symbols in public life. And you have to act out a certain way. You have to congregate, you have to gather, you have to take out a procession. You have to chant loudly. You know, all those mm. things are very public. And that would necessitate uh, having some people who define what that expression is going to be, which is the clergy or the priestly class. And because of the Protestant uh, problem and the conflict with the clergy, uh, they wanted to do away with it. And so they devised and innovated in this way and they carried out the reformation, made religion an entirely private affair. Right. And the consequences of that were secularism, of course, that right. you have a public sphere and you have the private sphere and religion is restricted to the private sphere. And any expression of religion in the public sphere is frowned at, to, speak, to say the least. Right. Uh, so th this is pretty common knowledge now, right. uh, except uh, to those who don't want to. You, know, right. you can't wake up a person who's pretending to be sleeping but, to appear asleep. Uh, like in, if you can simplify it, we can say that secularism itself is a religious idea. Oh, yes. Secularism is, as he says, uh, and several other scholars mm. also point out, secularism is a deeply Christian idea and uh, a Protestant one at that. Mm. And so the, the expansion of Christianity into uh, other cultures uh, has happened far more efficiently through, secular, through, the, through secularism mm. as opposed to direct conversion, which is the point that he's making. Correct. Correct. So, uh, if I can slightly digress on the subject and say that the reaction to this form of secularism in India uh, came with another form of secularism where they labeled the first form as pseudo-secular and their form as true secular where everybody is allowed to have a public display of religion. The only thing that they also frown is the clergy. Let's not set the rules. Let people display their religious beliefs in public. When, no, when so we talk about temples and rituals, in that case. Ah, so, pseudo-secular, uh, the idea of pseudo-secular and real-secular is mostly 
founded on ignorance right of true secularism anyway because there is only one secularism one there is no pseudo secularism <laughs> there is one secularism right uh, however the difference that they are pointing out is uh, i've i've read the works of this canadian legal philosopher who is also i think he's a committed christian in by belief uh, right. uh, his name is ian ian stevenson or Ian Benson, uh, and he defines secularism uh, uh, in very interesting ways. He says that there are four types of secularism: positive, secular, uh, positive, neutral, secular, uh, positive, neutral, negative, and one more. Uh, I think it's inclusive or something like that. Which is uh, the the difference between them is essentially how the state uh, treats religion. Does it ban all religion? or does it treat all religions equally is it indifferent towards religion because these are very different uh, positions to take as far as the state is concerned you can't say that you you can't just define yourself as secular without specifying are you going to promote all religions or are you going to be indifferent towards all religions or are you going to be uh, uh, you know uh, are you going to uh, equally promote or equally ban all religion right like france france likes very uh, famously is a case of positive secularism where it says that there is absolutely no place for religion in public life uh so that you have to specify is what his contention is and in that sense the secularism can manifest in various ways but the distinction between private and public and all that right. remains the same all right so uh since it remains and my point was more on the clergy side the hatred uh, towards the clergy <coughs> yeah where is the origin Whatever. because most of the theories that have been uh, sort of altered and uh, labeled on india like the, the hatred for Bra- brahmins right yeah yeah because they uh, they directly transposed their idea of uh, the priestly class to the brahmins the brahmins were not simply the priestly class hmm. the brahmins were much more than that right, right. and uh, much more than that as in the power sense or influence uh, no in the sense of what they truly stood for how aspirational they were mm. they were the guiding lights of the uh, and this is att- attested by none other than christian missionaries themselves mm. where they say that you know damn these brahmins if they were right. not there it would have been a christian country so uh, because they wrongly imagined or interpreted indian society or described indian society in a way that matched their own uh exp- lived experience of their own societies that is the root of the trouble and right. that is where uh, the hate for the priestly class and the clergy uh was uh, i mean got transferred to the indian society when we became secular right uh so one more point that he says is that uh, the secularized uh secularized sets of uh, belief like the biblical themes uh, sort of got uh assimilated in the social sciences domain and through that it has percolated to every uh, political thought in across the globe or more or less if we leave uh, islamic uh, ideology aside hmm. that's my because that is more or less have been able to uh, keep itself immune from the secularized notion of not really i mean there's they are also uh, <laughs> quite modernized in that sense they right. they are dependent on the same fossil fuels mm-hmm. they are fortunate to have Uh, the most of <laughs> the resources uh, all, all right. oil wells are there so uh, that way they are dominating so the the re- i i my uh, hypothesis is that they have been able to uh, keep at bay to certain extent not not to a great extent but to a certain extent the forces of modernity is because they own the oil <laughs> right so they 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 can afford to have their own way mm-hmm. the others simply don't have that choice right right so uh, the next part of the book more or less uh, is f- uh, focused greatly upon the use of language the vocabulary uh, between the difference between when we generally like in this conversation we are often using the word like gods mm. uh, without understanding the the origin of these words and that is where he has focused a lot in this book where he is uh, emphasizing that the meaning of polytheism is very different than what we understand mm. it is because of our lack of understanding of the original 
meaning that we often uh, equate the two. Hmm. So how does it equate? Equate theism with what? With, with our Indian beliefs, the Indian ah, culture. Okay. Let's, when we say that we are a polytheistic society, or okay. uh, similar notions that we often say when we use the term God for our uh -huh. uh, for our deities, right. let's say. So, uh, so the point is that should we uh, alter our vocabulary altogether, and sh uh, should ah, we progress a, towards that? I think that's a never-ending debate <coughs> because even. Even Rajiv Malhotra has written about that. Right. <clears throat> He's written about non-translatables, yeah. non-translatables in Sanskrit. Right. Um, and I, I think that there is a, uh, mm. there is a reasonable merit to that argument that you know, as far as possible, we should be using the original Sanskrit terms so that the authenticity of, uh, of the and the actual meaning mm. is conveyed uh, without loss of uh, data, loss of connotation, right, loss of meaning. But um, but we live in a dynamic world. I right. mean, uh, where we are, you know, accessing a lot of our tradition, as Balu points mm -hmm. out, through works written in English, for example. Right. Let's say you take uh, Anand Kumar Swami. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a it's such an excellent resource to understand Indian art in the current world. For someone like me, is indispensable. Right. right? Uh, because I I have not gone been to a gurukul mm -hmm. or not so have so haven't you right. right so for us resources like that are extremely important and so we are also having this conversation mm -hmm. in English right. uh, <clears throat> because a lot of the audience mm -hmm. especially in the south they don't understand Hindi right, right? so we have at upward we have chosen to be uh, to communicate in English right so uh, given our dependency on mm -hmm. Uh, on English and resources available in English, it's an open-ended question. How much uh, can we, uh, you know, how rigid do we want to be about not uh, using certain terms? Right. I think. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a difficult call for me. I don't really know. It's, right. it's very difficult to say. Where, I mean, whether go, using gods because it's convenient and it conveys uh, the idea sufficiently right. well, but to then nitpick. And uh, hair split as academics too, mm -hmm. which is their job, and they're doing it fairly. But we are yeah. not academics. Right. <laughs> so that brings me to the uh, to the aspect which we discussed in the previous book on diversity, where we showed how French was the lingua franca of the elite of uh, Europe in the 18th century, and how English took over it. So they changed the vocabulary. I mean, one can say that both of them share a very yeah. common sort of vocabulary, but that that's beside the point. The point is that. It was more of the economic uh, success of mm. the English mm. that it uh, sort of overridden the entirety of uh, French language in mm -hmm. uh, in Europe. So much so that the there have been committees in France which are dedicated to preserve the French language, mm. and sort of they have even tried to ban some works, right, right. English works. Right. So the, one can argue that the, the tussle is there in Europe. The uh, the language conflict is there in Europe, and same the language conflict is there in India itself. We have twenty two official languages, and if we start translating, then each language has its own uh, vocabulary, if, uh, different understanding of it. So, in which language should we translate? Because the the purpose of language is to communicate effectively for a lay person. For exactly. an academic. no, this goes back to the point that we were discussing earlier about mm -hmm. uh, the insistence on Hinduism not being a religion right. by the Ghent school. Uh, that's a slippery slope in my opinion, mm -hmm. as I said. Uh, but this insistence, uh, I mean, the other side could always argue that uh, right. religion is not the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, someone like Dr. Conrad Elst, right. uh, he has, he gave a talk for us long time back mm -hmm. on where religion comes from, the etymology of religion, and you know, it comes from religare or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he came to the conclusion that what dharma means mm -hmm. is to sustain, religare or religare, whatever it is called, is to also hold. to hold, to bind. So etymologically, there is so much common between religion and dharma. While uh, later on, I mean, at, at another level or in another context, someone like Ram Swarup, mm -hmm. Not, not incorrectly at all, would argue that dharma and religion are not the same. Hmm. Now, it depends on what religion means. So, the question then becomes whether you want to appropriate religion, hmm. the term, and say that, no, this is, 
for that you need to have sufficient power right. hard and soft Correct. to be able to say that no religion means hmm. how we define it and the rest okay. have to follow and otherwise you know you tend to lose the meaning of the term Correct. things like that. so these are very i think these are eth- ethereal <laughs> debates uh, best suited for uh, right. within the academia and i think we can for the most part i think we can safely use the word gods this is my personal opinion right, right. you can use the term gods and you can use the term spirituality and you know, <laughs> things like that because it conveys most of the meaning i mean even if right. some of it is lost right so i'll uh, i would like to end this conversation with another quote from the book uh, where he describes that we cannot instill pride in our children about their culture and traditions by telling them that these are all manifestation of Brahman. basically he's talking about gods and different gods and if you try talking with them you will have to uh, you will not be able to answer the question why not worship brahma directly without having the worship of all these strange things about the deities yeah. without making your ancestors and the rest of indians look like fool make them first understand that these questions have their roots in the semitic religion and these contempt and the contempt these religions have for indian tradition tell them subsequently that it is their task to figure out what puja is because it is not worship again the point of terminology of course this requires honesty on our part we can can we tell our children that we ourselves have failed in making sense of our tradition in the last few centuries and decades yeah i mean that's the part of their scholarship that misses me <laughs> I, i i just watch it go past and i don't know what to do with it because puja upasana aradhana i mean these are all paryavachi shabd paryavachi words uh, etymologically synonyms. all can uh, mean or, or most of them would mean something different yes like sadhana uh-huh. upasana like uh, aradhana uh-huh. archana <laughs> puja <laughs> all these are all these have very specific correct connotations and uh, there is a wo- overlap with uh, worship also ha uh-huh. so to completely deny that i i can't buy that argument maybe i'm missing something right uh, given that you know we are talking uh-huh. i mean we're talking of a work which is so profound and so uh-huh. deeply thought through so maybe i'm willing to you know give myself that uh, i mean take take the onus of ignorance on my part but for practical reasons i don't i don't know i mean i, I don't see any difference between worship and puja as right. such but um, yeah i mean it, again i think a lot of this as i said uh, we have to be charitable with it and say that if we want to understand the the whole conceptual framework that balu has so painstakingly developed over the course of many decades we have to cut him some slack and right. go with the flow and try to understand what he's saying and mm-hmm. then maybe come back take it and leave leave what you uh, mm-hmm. don't find useful right instead of getting into this unending debate about mm-hmm. you know oh no 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 we are a religion no 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 we are not religion is point right correct right. and uh, and about what uh, this that most of these questions are uh, again I, know, I, I i don't yeah. to some extent they are in popular culture in in let's say in how how they basically idol the question question of idol worship in children ask that why are we worship no but i'm idol? saying that i'm saying that in popular culture in the media in any form of organized information broadcast uh these are semantic tropes uh and there is a motivation right. behind uh propagating these views but i don't think that is the case with children hmm. although the children of course are exposed to that kind of culture they are born right. into modernity <clears throat> but it is a genuine expression of curiosity to say right. why can't we do that and the onus is on us to explain why there are so many gods and why that uh, you know why, why this is a more uh, f- fulfilling and more uh, complex right. a more uh, satisfying a more evolved system than the other where you are just there is no intermediary and you believe right. something and uh, because someone died some 2000 years ago and you will be saved and the other guy will die i mean that that obviously i mean that much we can explain to children right <laughs> you compare for yourself and see which is a better uh, system system <laughs> can uh on that note we'll take your leave uh please do like this uh, video and share it forward and subscribe to upward thank you